you know, it, it, it's just really hit and miss on who it is. I mean, yeah. if like why come in if you're trying to talk your engine right now, if you need a cylinder or something, it's like you need a storm before, before anything even comes out. It's a, it's it's definitely been a challenge. I mean, 2020, everybody COVID is a horrible thing, shut down the industry. We were so busy, you know, not saying people not like you guys, I mean maybe you guys, but Everybody was home, they had time to mess with their aircraft, and we were just beyond busy. Just record sales, and now this year, we're still as busy, but we can't provide, I mean, we've got back orders with, I mean, everybody in the industry. I mean, hardware, like the little things like hardware has been just such a pain to, you know, just to get a hold of it. So, that's kind of where we're at. But when it comes in, if your name's on it, I mean, it's going right back out the door pretty much the same day. Yeah, question. Is there anything going to be that you would buy now as opposed to waiting for the or anything available now that was just Well, Tempest, they, we were like back ordered, and you know, I was having people, same thing with like air shell groups, you know, like air shell 22 grease, if that's something you use. If you've got it, you need to buy it because, like, one of their big plants that makes all the roofs burn down here like a month ago. And so, and so I mean, if like air, if grease is something, air show grease, I'll put it right there. That's a fine thing to add it. it. Like I said, it's really kind of hit and miss. I mean, we'll, we'll get a big batch of oil filters, but then we won't get any for four months. So, anything on your what I've done for, I mean, what I've done my whole career is like internal parts on engine work, like rebuilding engines, and all the piece parts, like everything that it takes to get to, to put those together. The shortage just on parts because, like, why come in Continental? You know, they're not putting anything out, and so I mean, I deal with this daily. With I mean, I deal with this daily with customers, and you know, I, I sell at a lot of engine shops, you know, with builder engines. And, I work real close with some of the guys. Bill Wagner, the Sky I think he's speaking tomorrow. He's a good friend of mine. And, you know, I call those guys. I'm like, hey, you might not need these piston pins right now, but it's going to, or these lifter bodies, but it's going to be six months because, like, the steel that they make uh, lifter bodies out of, why can't you get them? You know, they're being made in Mexico, and it's, it's amazing. Like, we'll, we'll have them. I mean, we've got thousands. I mean, the back orders that we have, them, I mean, it's mind blowing. Like what we just can't get right now. But, but grease, oil, and grease is what I would probably stop at. But, but answer the question. Sorry, I just went, went off. <laughs> so what you're saying that it sounds like a, a steel shortage is there a labor shortage involved too? Well, I mean there. I hear from like, a bunch of different things, you know, about the bar just not being unloaded and just they can't get they can't get all the bars. But the still has been, you know, with what I do, it's still been one of the, the biggest problems. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, but, I mean and see if I mean they are, but I don't know if you buy tires now to like, wait till the winter to, I you know they don't have they they do have some type of expiration date, but I mean yeah, if you need tires, I mean I would definitely I would get them, but if you're not gonna need them for a year, I wouldn't get them. I mean they should come back online, I would think. Anybody else? Yeah, that's right. Well thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tommy. Glad you're here and it's glad to be recognized by Aircraft Spruce as an organization. Uh, Chip Christie, there. Talk about what we've got going on there, I'm sorry.
Good morning. So uh, you may have seen some of this before, but it's, uh, we'll go through the, everything just for the benefit of the new owners and uh, the fresher um, on the history of the Aerostar and the history of um, <coughs> Aerostar Aircraft and also Mock and Inc., which is uh, the company that was formed clear back in the 70s and um, has a lot of STCs for the Aerostar. So uh, the designer, Ted Smith, or the visionary, Ted Smith, um, the objective was make an affordable piston twin, and this is back in 1963, roughly, um, to make it uh, a twin that's faster, safer, more dependable, and comfortable than any other plane available at the time. Hmm. Here's a picture of Ted. I didn't know Ted very well. Some of the um, people that worked there at the time and worked with Ted, Ted and designers um, would have more information about him. At the time, I was kind of a peon. I worked in the, uh, the uh, what called the mod shop at the time. And I, when I went to work there, I had an A&P license. And I, I said, well, now, I thought you guys were in the factory. And the uh, shop foreman said, um, well, with an A&P license, you can work in the mod shop. I said, mod shop? Where is that? He said, well, after we build the basic airplane, then we install all the options that the dealers want, like um, surface of the ice, prop the ice, air conditioning, autopilots, interiors, and that sort of thing. So after the airplane was certified, we went to the mod shop. Uh, this is 1973 time frame. I don't know what happened before that, but all the airplanes were the same. They were all certified. Then they went to the mod shop and they got torn apart again. We had all the uh, improvements. But Ted was um, <clears throat> a designer uh, long before he came up with the Aerostar, and um, he worked for Douglas Aircraft Company, and, and uh, he also started the Aero Commander. Company. And one of his last projects was the Air Command of Jet uh, before he went off on his own to, to develop the Aerostar. <clears throat> um, the Aerostar was all done in the slide wheel, so there weren't very many computers used in aircraft design at the time, which was kind of interesting. My partner, Steve Spear, was one of the first computer savvy engineers to work for Aerostar. He brought in his uh, card deck. And calculated various performance changes and that sort of thing. So he was the new guy and the real high-tech guy at the time. And we have all the drawings and, and uh, <laughs> engineering reports for the Star, and they're all beautifully um, <clears throat> put together with slide rules and graph paper. And, you know, they calculated all the performance um, without computers at the time. <clears throat> Now, at the time, uh, Ted said that he was really interested in a new fan jet engine that was supposed to come out, and in fact, they had the one Aero Commander in Europe. And it never came to fruition, but he thought a small fan jet airplane would really be the role for the Aerostar. When he designed it, he designed it so that it was capable of being really high indicated speeds. <clears throat> so, um, by that I mean um, no wing incidents, no twist in the wing, and it was the only light twin in production that had uh, no twist in the wing, and that's more of a jet thing than a piston airplane thing. So um, it is one of the only airplanes that you could put jet engines on and just go fly. None of the other piston twins were capable of that without major changes. Uh, the thickness of the airfoils is, is one of those things, like a beach bear and a wing is 16% thickness ratio, and the wing on the Aerostar is a 12% thickness ratio, and the empennage is 10%, which is very thin and um, low drag for an airplane of that era. The mid-wing configuration, I've heard lots of uh, ideas about this, but it was kind of a Ted Smith trademark. Now, it was, there was a departure from the other piston twins because of the structure. You can see in the outer 
wing area, there's only three or four ribs, where in the barren, there might be 15 or 18 ribs. So they use very thin skins and lots of ribs and lots of stringers. And Ted's idea was, hey, let's minimize the understructure and use a thicker skin, 50,000 aluminum skins and wings and uh, at least 32 and multiple layers of skin and fuselage. So, that was highly promoted, and I think it's stood the test of time very well. Um, you know, a lot of these airplanes, like a Cessna 310 or 340, um, you see smoking rivets everywhere because the skins are so thin that they, the rivets loosen up and they start to make black dust, which is uh, not the case with the uh, Aerostar so much. Sometimes you see a little black dust where the inboard, inboard the engines. <clears throat> and that, a lot of that is from the pneumatic pump regulators. So the pneumatic pumps are carbon veins and they can uh, create a little black dust that looks like a smoking ribbon. But in order to, we've looked at a lot of them where people complain, hey, are those wind are loose? No, they're not loose. And you can just push up on the wing skin and tap it and see, is the wing skin really loose or is that just carbon dust from the uh, wing regular, from the regulators for the pneumatic pumps? In most cases, the ribbons are loose. <clears throat> so 1963, they started the company. And this is a, a magazine cover, I guess it's 1966, it says, where we're going to have an all-new, low-cost, high-performance flight twin, the Aerostar. And at the time, you know, there were a lot of airplanes that looked uh, like an Aztec was modern day. This looks like a rocket ship compared to an Aztec. And um, so the idea was initially to have four-cylinder, um, two-bladed prop engines on the airplane, 180 horsepower engines. And they actually did have a type certificate that they did certify the airplane with those engines. Um, there's a picture of the first one flying. Um, I'll leave it to some of the uh, guys that worked there at the time and maybe to expound on that, but uh, I don't think it was that much of a performer and Ted was out for a high-speed taxi and decided to go ahead and fly it. Um, he's great. He took off. In fact, he did the same thing with the Aerostar 800 in San Maria. Um, he was he was out there going to do a flyby or something, and he was gone for an hour and a half. <laughs> Help flying the airplane. <clears throat> so they pretty soon realized, hey, we need six cylinder engines here. And <clears throat> he was able to certify that um, in 1968 as a 600 Euro star. And then shortly thereafter, in November of that year, they certified the turbocharged 601. Now today, that would take three or four years at very minimum to get something like that done. But they were a small organization. They didn't rule by committee. They ruled by Ted Smith. And they just got one thing after another done and moved on. And of course, the FAA, their uh, charter at the time was to foster general aviation. That's no longer in their charter. It's to regulate you guys. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not sure on the history, but the company was sold. I understand that uh, Ted was backed by some investors, and once he got the airplane production and started producing airplanes, they said, let's sell. Let's sell the company and make some money. And they sold it to a company, American Cement, who was trying to diversify. Um, and they thought, hey, aviation is the way to go. Well, they soon realized they don't know anything about aviation. And it's a good way to lose a lot of money if you're not familiar with what's required. And so along came a guy from they, they made uh, they had FDOs around the country. If you've ever been to San Francisco International, you see a big hangar over there that says Butler Aviation. Well they had a really you know, flamboyant salesman who said, hey I'll buy the company and and uh, we'll you know we'll combine it with Mooney. And they already own the Mooney. Um, so anyway, uh, but we owned it for a while, but when it came time to make the first payment, they didn't make it. Uh, it was like 10 million bucks, and they couldn't, they didn't come up with the money. So 
It was kind of in limbo for a while, the airplane, but then during that time, Ted Smith came up with, hey, I want to make an even better airplane than an Aerostar. And the story I heard it was he went to the people that owned the Aerostar and said, well, guys, uh, the Aerostar now is obsolete. I developed a Superstar. And I had a jet version of it, and I have a cylinder version and higher pressurization. And so if you want to sell it, I'll make you an offer. And, you know, I think you should take it because your airplane has no future. <laughs> <laughs> and it was distinctive enough. It looked a little different. It had the cruciform tail. And uh, the emergency exit was in the roof. He just made it different enough that it looked a little different. And, um, Bill Bridges and Dolly sent me this picture of that airplane that he used. It was uh, 72 Tango Sierra. And you can't see it in this picture I just copied, but it has a cruciform tail. Um, it had the cruciform tail and the emergency exit in the roof. And you see the picture window there on the side of the airplane as well. And that was kind of a trademark of the Aero Commander. He made the Aero Commander with the big picture window. Um, right here. <clears throat> and I think when he got that, this was an unpressurized, unpressurized airplane that he was playing with um, during the time when he didn't own the company to when he bought it back again in 72, 73. She went back to the production in 73. So uh, he was at the Aerostar owners meeting and he told everybody, hey, we'll get the company back, we'll go back in the production. And of course, there was no way at the time, to there was no reason to produce another version, so he just continued to make the airplane that was already certified. And I went to, I went to work there about 1973. Um, this is a picture of the uh, this is a picture of the hangar, the World War II hangar at Santa Maria Airport. And they built the airframes, or they, they, they built them, first of all, they built the airframes in an off airport facility. And here's one that's just about ready to be uh, trailered over to the World War II hangar. So they built the fuselage and all the components. There was a tail section nose section, center section, floor section, and then they put them all together in what they call the mating jig, where all these pieces came together, they ribbed them together, and when it was done, they towed it to the hangar where they put the wings on. Now they had a supply of wings because, um, I think it was uh, American Cement, when they got into the business with the airplane, they said, well, Let's get some economy of scale. Let's just order 150 ships at its wings. Let's order um, all new King radios, 150 ship sets. Let's get some economy of scale here. Well, they ordered all of that, and they never built one airplane. So that became part of the inventory that Ted Smith bought, and so they didn't have to make wings for the, until 150 airplanes later. Um, at the time, you know, this competition was Beechcraft and Cessna, they were both coming out with pressurized airplanes, and of the thousand nine one seven four five six seven. Now, in one section of the uh, the World War II hangar, there was the R and D group, and you can see here this is the same airplane, seventy two Tango Sierra, that has now been stretched. The section right here. <laughs> this section right here was a stretch, and it still has a piece of one tail. And they installed eight cylinder Lycoming engines on the airplane. Um, for weight and balance purposes, they added two more batteries to the tail cone. Um, because the airplane was a little dose heavy, but I asked uh, the chief test pilot, I saw him actually at an Aerostar Owners Conference in Colorado Springs, Pat Barnes, and I said, hey Pat, how did that 800 fly? Because I never talked to anybody that flew the airplane. He says, that's the same. That's just the same. <laughs> so we mm -hmm. stretched it to put a different tail on the plug. So that was, uh, 
It was in development, and I'm sure this is about 1976 or so. And there was the, when it was finished, uh, it had the stars and bars paint job because it was 200 year anniversary in the US. Yeah, 1976, and they were promoting the airplane. And at some point, um, and I think it was in 76 that Ted went in for a heart bypass and uh, didn't, it wasn't, he, he, December of 76, passed away. And of course the family was, wanted to keep everything going, but they couldn't pay the inheritance tax. And so the company had to be sold. That's, you know, that's second-hand information that I heard. Um, now Bill Leeds is here with us today. He's, uh, raise your hand, Bill, so everybody can find out the real scoop if they need to. <laughs> they were there. I wasn't, well, I was there, but I, didn't, I wasn't involved with the higher up. And Bill was there from day one. And so they were promoting the airplane and had a lot of competition from Cessna and uh, Beechcraft dealers, and they had 10 dealers in the United States, and they had a dealer meeting once a year, and all the dealers would agree to buy 10 airplanes. And they put down a real small deposit, and then they would uh, pay for the airplanes when they were ready. And uh, it was, they were doing really well. Um, and in 78, they made some big improvements to the airplane, where the um, the airplane was much more capable of flying at higher altitudes at high speed. Back in 75, uh, there was a Dr. McClendon that had an Aerostar, and he was really an enthusiast, and they came out with this higher, um, higher altitude turbos and waste gates. But before that, uh, they brought his airplane out, and they said, Jim, go over there and work on Dr. McClendon's airplane, and take the waste gates off, and make sure everything fits perfectly, and file on whatever you have to do, because we want it to be able to produce full power 15,000 feet. Well, it wouldn't do that initially, but we just barely squeaked it out. Everything was perfect, and it had full power at 15,000. Well, shortly after that, uh, there was an attempt to fly around the world, and I was in the customer service department at the time, off the floor, talking to mechanics out in the field that needed to know how to do something. They could call in, and, and I would try to help them. And they said, hey, um, I think it was called a flight hangar at the time. Here, you've got a Cessna 150. Fly down to Van Nuys and take these four turbochargers and waste gates to the flight hangar to build bridges. Because he's going to put them on his airplane, he's going to do a trip around, they're going to do a trip around the world and try to set a world record. So I took the parts down there and, and came back and they made several attempts, but they were also burning pistons on the engines because now the airplane would produce a lot of power, like 28 inches at 25,000, but they were still running the engines very lean and they were having problems. I think they made five attempts before they made it around the world and set the new world record that still stands today. Um, and, and so, um, and there's, I, this, the guy that wrote these ads was very clever um, for Aerostar. They were promoting how it carries the 601, can carry a lot more weight and go really fast. Um, but at some point, when after Ted passed away, the, the company was sold to Piper Aircraft, and they kind of um, they kind of inherited this problem with the engines uh, burning pistons. And Lycoming, I think at the time, said, "You know, we're not going to sell you guys any more engines until you get that figured out." So they sent somebody out, and they did a detonation survey. Um, and they said, well, okay, you're going to have to increase the fuel flows on these engines by three or four gallons per hour each to keep them from detonating at high altitude. Or, um, that was a 601P, or you can, um, you can put in low compression engines, which are less susceptible to detonation. And 
there was another option, which was to put on a good intercooling system so that, that we thought there was an opportunity there. And, and in fact, my partner Steve went down to Aerostar and promote, said, hey, we can intercool the engine and fix that problem for you. But I think for Piper, their decision was, hey, we can put in a low compression engine that's less susceptible to this, uh, and we don't have to change anything. No intercoolers, no nothing. Same horsepower. We'll, and, um, we'll just set the manifold pressure and RPM uh, to get the same horsepower and we don't have to recertify the airplane. And they were selling airplanes at the time, so that probably was the right decision for them. Um, then along came Mock and Inc., and this was a company that my uh, an engineer at Aerostar, Steve Spear, uh, I worked in the same office with Steve. And he said, uh, you know, at the time we were working for Ted Smith Aerostar, and they had the world's fastest, um, you know, piston airplane, civilian piston airplane. And when Piper bought them, it was kind of like going from the Ferrari factory to the Chevrolet plant. <laughs> You didn't have that same camaraderie of all the people making this free air um, And so Steve said, hey, why don't you, why don't you uh, quit? Uh, I, I moved on to an Airstar dealer, but he said, why don't you uh, find a guy that wants to bring us the first airplane and we'll put 350 horse engines on it. Actually, at the time, he said, we'll put PQ6 engines on it and make it go 400 miles an hour. And the problem with that was the engine was too long. So we would have had to stretch the airplane and fit the engines in there, which is a monumental job. And so um, I found a guy, Dr. Eskew from North Carolina, and he had this Aerostar that was a converted pressurized Aerostar. If you ever, um, you ever see an Aerostar with you know, the door handle, there's a door handle here and the one up there, the standard one, they have the same door handles up in the top and bottom. Well, he had a 1970 Aerostar that was converted to a pressurized airplane by Ted Smith when he didn't own Aerostar in those 70, 1972 or 1970s to 72 years. Anyway, he brought us an airplane and we decided we wanted to put 350 horse engines on it. And he was he was happy with that, and what we really wanted to do was uh, change the pistons in the existing engines, reduce the compression, up the manifold pressure, install intercoolers, and develop 350 horse. And my company said, absolutely not. We'll fight you on that with the FAA. You need to buy the J2BV engine that's used in the NAVO. That's a good engine. So. We agreed, now we had just installed that in the hands, so we had some experience with that engine. And uh, we decided, okay, we'll reconfigure the engine so it fits in the Aerostar engine compartment, which required us to shorten it about seven or eight inches. Um, we got it all in there, and we, we also um, installed intercoolers in the wings. And, um, we soon learned that the intercooler was the most powerful part of the whole package. Now that intercooler was really, really well done. And when we later made intercoolers that went on in the cell, they were they were just as effective and had the same negligible drag. So as it turned out, uh, we ended up with the intercoolers on the bottom of the cowlings instead of in the wings. And that took it. That was a two-day job instead of a three-week job. So we could sell a lot more of them when they were easily installed in the field. But the performance was basically the same. So here's, here's a new company that came on line that was really a thorn in the side of Piper. Because they were trying to sell you a 602P with 290 horsepower. And let's take your 601P and trade for, we paid 300 for it, let's give you 200. And we'll sell you a new 602 for uh, 437,000. So that means I've got to come up with 237,000 plus my airplane, which is three years old. Um, well, what does it do any better? 
than to sit there and want to have it. Well, it doesn't do anything like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's new and it has new avionics. And, you know, well, my airplane, I just got to keep up after three years and I've got 300 hours on it. So there were a lot of owners. Um, they actually, um, and this is a 602P brochure that Piper had. And, um, they, they initially called it the Piper Sequoia. Um, and fortunately, that name was already taken, so they decided let's call it the 602P. Um, so that was the, the 602P was just a 601P that had the low compression engines to get rid of the detonation of the And a lot of uh, owners that had 601Ps said to us, they called and said, well, can you guys make my airplane into a 602P? And we thought, yeah, we could do that, but why would we stop at 200 horsepower? We have the ability to raise it more than that, so uh, we developed what we call the Superstar 1. Now, at the time, anybody that had a Superstar had the uh, 350 horse engines. And interestingly enough, we didn't know Ted Smith called his new airplane a Superstar at the time. We thought, hey, we came up with a really cool name. Now, we couldn't use the name Aerostar because that was a trademark name that belonged to Piper. So we called ours a Superstar. And then we said, okay, now what are we going to do is we, we call this. What are we going to call this new airplane? Well, everybody wants a Superstar, so let's rename the Superstar to Superstar 2, and we'll call this airplane the Superstar 1. Um, and Piper did the same thing with the Cheyenne years ago. They made the Cheyenne. Then they called it the Cheyenne 2, and they made a lower powered version called the Cheyenne 1. So uh, for around $45,000, we would take in the 601P and give it 325 horsepower. Just change the pistons, turbochargers, fuel injection system. And um, we sold, I'm going to say, 60 a year for quite a few years. Well, that really cut into Piper sales. Um, why would I buy a new 602 when for 50 grand I can upgrade my airplane and have more power? And at the time, we were, we would uh, went to Jeffco Airport, demonstrated the airplane to three owners, and all three bought the conversion right then and there. After they saw, hey, the single engine performance is fantastic compared to what I had. So the Piper sales guys said, hey guys, we got to have a 700. We've got to have 350 horse engines. And it was in 1983 they developed a 700P, and they called them all 1984 models. They only made 25 airplanes. And the reason is sales plummeted in 1982. And part of this was because the 601 piece, they made so they made 155 in 1979, and over 180 and 81, and there were so many really nice low-time airplanes out there that it was hard to sell a new one. And you can see they dropped to uh, 21 airplanes in 1983, and then the 700 p they made 25 in the Baltic production. And this is very um, much the same with Beach and Cessna. The, 19, the latest, the last three, four years was about 1985. Because there were so many nice airplanes hard to sell a new one. They had to have a big increase in performance. So, um, parts were getting hard to come by because Piper was uh, having a hard time paying the vendors. And in that time period, 84, 85, 86, uh, the airplane got a reputation for being, well, it's a nice airplane, but you can't get parts for it. Because you can call Piper and you didn't have it. Um, so, we, we talked with them several times, and finally, when the airplane, the company got sold the second or third time to a fellow named Stuart Millar, he owned an Aerostar when he bought Piper. And um, so we, we established some of the four with him. I called him as soon as he 
bought the company and I said, hey, can, we'd like to meet with you and we've got some ideas for a, you know, a jet version of the airplane. We can get it all certified and put it in production. Hey, that sounds great. He says, uh, when can we get together? I said, well, um, it's, it's 12 o'clock now. How about 3.30? <laughs> he was in uh, Santa Ana, uh, John Wayne Airport, now they call it. I thought, let's get the start to fly down there today and see if we can. And he said, well, well, how about, you know, let's, let's do it next week. And I said, okay, fine. So we met with him and, and we told him uh, <clears throat> he loved the Aerostar, but the Aerostar wasn't, and he owned a 700p. He bought one of the 25. And, um, but Piper didn't love it like he did. And so, I remember he invited us to go down to uh, to uh, Florida, Vero Beach. They were developing the Malibu at the time. And they had actually already had it developed and they were in production, but they were having problems with the engine. And I thought, well, that's an engine that was developed specifically for this airplane. How can we be having problems? He said, well, the quality control is terrible. Um, they, they won't torque the through bolts on some of the engines. And it, blows the cylinder off and on and on. He said, I'm going to put a light on the engine in there. And um, why don't you guys come down and consult with my engineers on the uh, intercooling system, because we're on the intercooling. So we went down there, and the new steward and entry was really nice, but the rest of the uh, guys, they didn't have any use for us. We are modifying their airplanes. And, and I remember talking to the chief engineer on that, or the engine guy, and I said, well, how effective is an intercooler on your own hobby? And he kind of gave me a blank stare, and it's, you know, like, what is the temperature of the air going into the engine? He said, well, I don't know. What's a light on you think? It's light on Okay, well, when you're making the inlet for the intercooler, um, they didn't have any idea. Um, but there was a guy, the chief engineer, Griswold, he had some idea. He was a pretty sharp guy. Um, but anyway, uh, that was a waste of time for them. It was fun for us to go down there and see Stewart and go to lunch at the country club with them and you know, talk about airplanes. But um, we said, well, why don't you let us put that? He wanted the like on the engine in there because of the quality control. I said, why don't you let us do that for you? We'll do it probably for 500 grand. We'll get that in there and get the certified. Well, he says, I've got all these engineers. He says, they all want to do it here. I said, yeah, well, okay. You know, we have things to do. We don't need to do it, but we can do it for you. We just did it for a bonanza. Now, that isn't as complex. As, you know, we did it for the V-tail and the straight-tail bonanzas and got it all certified, so the Malibu was coming no problem. And later on, he told me it cost him five million dollars to get the certified. Mm. So it's just you know they had fifty engineers, and at the time we said, hey, uh, you know, you guys need a separate inlet for that intercooler. Um, just on the nose bowl, make a couple of slots there and feed the intercoolers with this high velocity air off the top. And they talked to the guy who was in charge of the nose cowl. This is how many people they had. They had one engineer in charge of the nose cap. I don't know how many engineers they had in charge of the exhaust pipes and the <laughs> fuel injection, you know. Uh, but he said, no, no, there's no possible way. We've already made that to die uh, for the nose cowl because we're going to make it out of aluminum instead of fiberglass because the fiberglass erodes with moist with rain and ice. Okay, so they decided, no, they're not going to do that. So anyway, we put in our two cents and, and uh, they continued. They came out with a nice installation. just took longer than a small company would take to do the same thing. Well, at the time, Stuart then uh, got to the point where he said, you know, we're having financial problems. And the only, um, I don't want to leave all the Aerostar owners hanging. If we file bankruptcy, they're going to be the last ones to get any parts from Piper. So I'll sell it to you guys uh, the 
because you're the only people I know that could possibly support it with spare parts. So he didn't need to sell it to us, and I'm sure he could have got more money to sell it to somebody else, but he just thought, okay, you've got a track record. You can probably make spare parts if you can make all these aftermarket parts. So fortunately, um, we, we did buy it, and at the time we were in Spokane, and we moved to this facility at uh, Port Lane Airport just because uh, we could buy the buildings and rent on the leased land where you couldn't do that in Spokane. Here's a picture of the hangar. We can get about seven airplanes in there. Um, this is quite some time ago. But you can, you know, we do engine convert, do all these things listed on the right side of that slide. Engine work. We can do upholstery. We're probably not the best shop for upholstery because we have to have mechanics do it. And it costs a lot more than a dedicated upholstery worker. Um, some people wanted everything cherried out, like, uh, you know, this. Uh, this slide right there is the mill steer, and, and he wanted everything taken out, stripped, painted, you know, put back together better than do, because it wasn't stripped and painted necessarily. And so, what do we do for the airplane now? Well, mostly modifications. Uh, the intercooling system on the bottom of the cells is big, a big winner. We've done over half the fleet with intercoolers. Um, the Vortex generator kit was generated because of an AD note um, that some hyper test pilot said, hey guys, that thing doesn't pass the requirements for power on stalls. You can't maintain the heading of power on stall until the airplane stalls, which was in FAR, you had to be able to do that. Well, that was very subjective. And at the time, when the airplane was certified, it was kind of up to the test pilot to decide how long he's going to hold the stick back while the airplane is stalled before he recovers. And it's become more and more dumbed down so that, you know, a brain dead pilot can actually recover from the stall uh, without doing anything. Um, so that's a nice thing to have. Um, how many people are going to get down to 60 knots in the power on the stall? and not recover. Not, very, not anybody in this room, I think, would get down to 60 knots, but that was an FAA, re FAA requirement, that you had to hold the heading until the airplane stalled, and when you're at FCG, it doesn't stall, you just get to the F stick limit, and then you hold it for a couple seconds and recover. Well, it wouldn't quite do that. The P factor of the engines would make the airplane walk off to the left, before it stalled and couldn't hold the heading. So we fixed all that. We found out that when the rudder was deflected, it started to stall. It didn't it started to separate. So you had no more rudder power at 30 degrees than you had at 10. And that was the problem. And by adding vortex generators, we were able to keep the flow attached to the rudder even at 30 degrees. Now there was more to it than that. Anybody has questions after the session can tell you there's lots of things that went into that. But that's basically, you know, I want to say 80% of the Aerostars have that system. Um, we also increased the cabin pressure on our first airplane. That was part of the requirement. The owner said, hey, I've got a 3.25 PSI cabin and all the new ones are 4.25. Can you guys increase it? 4.25. And we said, sure, how hard could that be? You know, we could do that. And uh, so we got it done at the time, but it was a big job. Um, then there was a few things like, hey, some airplanes, you know, 1981 new airplanes had no ice. And so a lot of customers wanted that. It was already approved. We just started making the parts again to do that. And then we had some uh, issues with the landing gear torque lines breaking. And the airplanes running off the runway. If they had the big dash six landing gear brakes, they could probably hold it on the runway even if the wheel turned sideways, which some customers were able to do. So that became kind of a, a, a service bulletin thing. And then, then we had some uh, landing gear side braces breaking. 
Well, they always blame that on the pilot. He had a hard landing or he landed sideways, broke the side brace, gear collapses, hits the prop. Um, we come to find out that they didn't really test that properly. That instead of putting a side brace in there, they said, well, there's no load on the side brace. So let's just put a piece of angle iron in there and do the test. You know, this is a test setup. Well, it turns out that there is a big load on the side brace as the airplane ages because the landing gear actually moves aft um, as things loosen up a little bit and you touch the mains on the runway, they want to go aft. And there's a big lever arm trying to make them go aft with how long the landing gear is compared to some airplanes. And so we had to make a more a stronger side brace and that became a big detail as well. So we, we do things like we fix issues that come up in addition to making the mods that we've made. Uh, the props, to this day, there's not been a better prop for uh, single engine performance and cruising speed. I once called uh, Hartsville and I saw I said, hey, I see all your ads for uh, the top prop. And, um, and the other guy said, well, what, what do you want it to do? I said, well, I just want it to go faster. We have takeoff performance, we have climb performance, we have single engine performance, single engine service ceiling. What can you do for us? And he said, well, we can make them 10 pounds lighter. And I said, are you telling me that you can't improve on a propeller whose airflow was designed before 1968? He said, yes, that's what I'm telling you. There's nothing new in Air Force since before 1968. So we've kept the same propeller and there's been a discussion about well, what about the long props versus the short props. Well, you on a 350 horse airplane, you do give up one second in acceleration to 40 knots. From zero to 40, longer props accelerate to that speed one second sooner. After that, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100, they're the same. It's just that initial thrust, um, static thrust. Problem. And so um, then there was another AD note where the tailpipe uh, cracked the well, rotated out of the way, and burned the wing off to it. And that became an AD mode. Everybody was grounded until they installed fire detection. And we made a fire detection kit right away and sold probably 500 of them because Piper couldn't sell them, couldn't make them fast enough. So some of them are Piper supplied fire detection, some are ours. And the idea was you have to have that until better tailpipe is designed. And so we tried to design a better one. And um, it's held on, you can see here with bolts. And there's a, there's a retainer behind the flange of the turbocharger and has studs that stick aft. And when you put the tailpipe on, it's held on the six nuts. So it's capturing the flange of the turbo. And we've never had one come off. Uh, and then there's also a tab on there that you can't see in this picture that's welded to the pipe. And there's a bolt that goes through the tab and is screwed into that capture of flange. And it's a shoulder bolt, so it screws in and uh, bottoms out in the, in the capture flange. And so if the weld ever broke, it still can't rotate out of the way. Um, which was the problem because, you know, seven inches behind that turbo was the wing spar, the firewall and the wing spar behind it. So we never ever want more of those to come off again. And I, we have not going to have had any problems with it. So this is kind of old news now. Everybody's got more modern 225 autopilot certified in the airplane. And, uh, 
I haven't flown any of the real, real new ones, but this is about as simple and intuitive as you can get. I know Joel Stout's installed a few of them, and, and you can ask him what he thinks of it. This is an airplane, one of the first ones I took a picture of. It's probably 10 years ago now, one of the first ones that had the bar 600. And it was just to show you we can do that stuff. We're not in the eye shop, but we have one on the field that will come. If your airplane's in for some work, we can probably schedule them to do some upgrades or whatever. But the, the autopilot, the big advantage of the autopilot was it had altitude pre select. And you can have that on the KFC 200, but it costs all of $10,000 to get the pre select installed with overall parts. If you put in all new parts, um, you know, it'd probably be eighteen, twenty thousand dollars to get pre-select. And so we had it in two twenty-five. And I was talking to a salesman that worked for uh, for Dennis King, who made this autopilot. And I told him about this issue of KFC two hundred. You can select ten thousand if you're descending. It'll come down to ten thousand uh, twenty feet and level off. And, and it'll sit there for one or two minutes, and then it'll start to descent. And when it goes through 10,000, the altitude hold light will go on, but it'll still descend 200 feet and slowly come back up to your altitude. I said, it does the same thing, fine. And he said, yeah, yeah. Well, I was flying with Ed one day, Ed King. And he says, and I showed him, that, you know, it would do that, and then it would start to climb, and the altitude hold would come on, but it wouldn't let it off. And he says, well, just push the altitude hold button. So I knew right then and there that would never get fixed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the 225 fixed it. If you close your eyes, you'd be climbing 2,000 feet, and then it went levels off, you can't rise, you'd be climbing 2,000 feet, and then it went levels off, you can't really tell. You can't really feel it. It's right on, dead on the number. It's really a nice improvement. Auxiliary fuel tanks are a big, uh, have been a big seller. Uh, we try to make sure that anybody buying, and this is just to enhance the value of the airplane. Anybody buying an airplane from Santa Barbara to uh, Rio, to Mexico, it's you know, 890 miles, and one carry four or five people, and uh, well, the Aerostar won't carry the load, so we'll cross that off the list. So in order to enhance the value and make it more saleable to everybody, we said, let's increase the useful load, let's increase the gross weight. We can do it. Um, so that's the reason we did it, and also uh, to make all you guys leave because we know you're flying <laughs> over the the original gross <laughs> So, nobody ever does, I don't understand. Your Honor. <laughs> so, uh, then the, the plexiglass top plate would craze after about three years, so we retooled it in glass. Then real quickly, uh, the original pressurized airplane had an auxiliary heating system, but once you pulled on the heat, you couldn't turn it off, because you had to push a cable to open the door, and you can't push a cable very easily. We thought we'd redesign that, and uh, we had to learn how to do an R&D project all over again. We tried to make a valve that would block the air like the original one did to the cooler, but what we didn't know was that cooler is going to radiate that heat anyway, even with no airflow through it. Most it's still 40, 50 percent efficient. So we had to redesign that, and it ended up um, we ended up with having a lot more valves and things in there than we originally wanted, but if you're in a cold climate and you have issues with your heater, something to consider. Once you turn that on, it's going to work, and it's going to work as well or better than the heater, but it won't work on a branch. It relies on compressed air from the turbochargers to create the heat. And in our testing at altitude, it was putting air out in the heater about 260 degrees. So uh, there's a cutoff switch in the system that will keep it from getting too hot, but that's the compressed air temperature, 260 degrees. That was at 35 inches, 2200, 25,000. 
So we knew, uh, actually we went to uh, an AOA meeting and it was in Ohio. And the FBO there also made winglets for the Oak Commanders. And people really liked the idea of winglets. And so we said, well, people are going to buy them. What, why don't we make them? And that took a lot longer because the prime directive was, don't make this airplane any slower. No matter what, and we're going to have to. We didn't like the looks of the little Aero Commander winglets, which are mostly for show. So we ended up with a fully blended winglet, and um, at various power settings, at, at normally 140 knots indicators were the most effective, and they're worth three to five knots at 140, and a better rate climb as well. At when you indicate 170 or 175. They're no slower, and they're not more than not faster than that. But there's no negatives to it. Uh, overhead duct, this is one of the first things in the prime directive for our first customer. He said, I want an engine driven air conditioner. Okay, well, in order to get this guy to come in, we said, okay, how hard can that be? You make an engine driven compressor for him. Then we found out that really part of the restriction was the overhead duct. You can have cold air coming out of there, but you're still sweating because you didn't have enough volume to cool down the cabin. So we added this um, this exit at the rear of the duct. In that previous slide, we added four outlets up front and moved the outlets from where the speaker is to where they are now, because the speaker wasn't in front of the duct. And, uh, I remember at the time, we had a customer, Bobby Allison, and he had five aerostars over the years, and I was telling him, I said, you know, you know what the FAA wanted to know? They wanted to know if we did a speaker survey. <laughs> and, and Bobby said, well, tell him yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, you asked the UPS driver, and he thought it was fine. <laughs> Here's just a shot. I just took some pictures of, you know, an airplane that, I guess this is a, in a climb of 16,000. But I had some other ones in cruise just to show people, you know, people would ask me, well, now, now how, how fast really does it go? You know, if you, you're saying it goes 245 knots at 65% power at 25,000, but, but how fast really is it? You know, is it, what, what is it really? I said, well, it really does 245 knots. Really? Because, because you know, I had a dude before and it says it went 235, but I, it would only go 215. Yeah, that was normal at the time. We used to say the first liar doesn't have a chance. <laughs> when you're competing with Cessna and Beechcraft, everybody, you know, had to say the very best they've ever seen, maybe in an updraft, you know. But, but when you're trying to sell somebody something for $150,000, you better do what you say it's going to do. So we took some photographs. And so, um, this was back in the 70s when Ted was very satisfied knowing the Aerostar had earned its rightful place. And there's the uh, Aerostar jet. Not a real practical program at this point, but what other airplane in the name that you can put two jet engines on and go 125 knots faster without any changes to the tail? Or the wings, really. So you should be uh, pretty happy to have it. Now Ted was an innovative guy, and I think he was trying to raise some money at the time back in the 70s, and he had some future airplanes that he could make to try to raise some money from TW Boyd Company, I think it was. And there's a single-engine turbo prop. He was way ahead of this time. Something like that. Then you have the single engine jet. That's going to cost you 400 grand in 1970. Mm -hmm. Then you have the 
tribes are going to That's going to be over a million bucks. And he, he really wasn't afraid of going fast at all. So he had a supersonic transport. <laughs> Three million bucks for that. It's probably super sweet. Yeah. I don't know how this one, this is a vertical takeoff turbo prop to me, it looks like. Anyway, then I have some other pictures. I don't know how we do it for time. Okay. Here's a picture. Some guy in Australia sent me this picture, but he was sending me a picture based on something else, and I saw, hey, he's got the old torque. And these would break right through there. So, you know, when you touch down, um, the engineers at our place calculated the loads, and they, and they said, when you touch down, you can have 4,000 pounds of force trying to move that tire. So you better have a torque plane that could take that uh, or more. And so that's just a slide of thought. And then Piper redesigned it, but I'm not sure uh, who came up with this idea. They designed a new one that didn't have the fork on one side, and they, they made the parts identical so you could swap from left to right. But they carved away half of the strength of the torque made by doing that, and they started cracking. And, um, and so this was the new design we came up with. Didn't require any recurring diameter inspections, and there's no sharp edges or short uh, areas there to crack or fail. Now here's an example of what all the mechanics have seen. Um, they, they talk about when you have loose rivets, or loose fasteners, they start making mud, or they start have fretting corrosion, that black stuff you see there. And you can see that they've been replaced already. You can see that one's cracked, and the fasteners are loose. And the fasteners have been replaced with bolts, so now we've got some big holes in that structure. And, and this is something I don't think very few airplanes are this way, in that the drag brace, at the very top you see the actuator. And the actuator extends, and then it pivots on a pin, where that big nut is, it pivots on a pin and retracts the nose gear. So here's where the pin is. right in there, and the pin is supported on one side of the nose gear only. And so that puts a big bending load on that side of the nose wheel well. And, and this area right here has a doubler on it. That's where the rod goes through to open and close the nose gear boards. And so that's a weak area because they've carved and made a lot of that structure. And then over on the other side, you see where the, that linkage to that torque tube at the top, there's the torque tube, and the linkage is actuated off the nose line here. And this is a, I don't remember the number, serial number, but it's like 6, 11 or not, have this structure, and right through there is a shear pin. So before they had that, if the nose gear doors hit something, like you put the gear up on the ground, the nose gear door, the gear opens in the nose gear doors, and you break this arm right off the casting. Well, they decided, hey, let's put, put that a different direction, and let's put a shear pin in there, so whatever happens, we just replace the shear pin. But um, in any event, it puts a lot of load on the side of that airplane skin and the wheel well. And the, all this structure that you see there, everything you see here is called the hat section. And um, that's taken a lot of load. Uh, when you put the gear up down, when you tow the airplane, all that load goes into that pin on the drag brace and works that wheel belt. And you can see 
Here's a diagram when people say the inner hat section. Well, that's on the inside of the wheel rack, and the whole structure there is to support um, oops. Uh, this whole this whole idea is this this aluminum piece right here is supporting some bushings, and the pin goes through that bushing, and the drag brace is on the end over here. So the whole reason for this is to locate this this uh, aluminum part that has bushings in it that the pin rotates in. So uh, then on the other side of the wheel well is the outer hat section. And it's basically the same, but it gives you more area for the pin to be supported. And a lot of times, um, that's where we see a lot of cracks. A lot of um, this area right here, you can see that by pulling the nose gear or access panel and looking in there, you can see it might be black. For any corrosion around those rivets or fasteners, because that's all working. That's all working. Now, sometimes when we take this stuff out, we see holes like this. Well, now, you know, they're not round anymore. Whoops. Um, these holes aren't round. So, are you going to put in new parts and oversize the holes? Well, probably not. You're going to just want to replace that skin. So, when you put your new parts in, it costs a lot of money. They're not oversized and worn out over it. And if you don't do it right, if you don't take the skin off the airplane and you're putting this outer hat section in, well, you're likely to hit the uh, drill chuck on your brand new parts and gouge the heck out of them. And you can see these, these, I can't tell if they're working or not, but I'm sure they work. So this, you know, you have to bite the bullet and pull the nose skin off the airplane. And uh, one time, this was a 600, nice little airplane, you can see that when they put this all together, um, the outer hat section bushing had fallen out, fallen out of the casting. It's supposed to be in here. And we found it in the outer hat section way down here. Push it out and put the pin in and roll it all the way down here. So now you don't have three bushings supporting the pin and you only have two. And I'm sure either they didn't know, probably didn't know when they put that pin in that they just pushed the inner bushing out that you can't get to. Now you've got to look at the whole thing and start over. So maybe they just decided, well, three's good, two's good enough. <laughs> Now, down at the very bottom of the outer hat section, you can see um, that's where a lot of this force is absorbed. You can see there's a crack here. This has been working. This vertical channel, uh, we replace on a lot of them because they're cracked. Once you get the skin on, you know, now's the time to do it. And here's this little bit slid sideways, but you can see even underneath the uh, underneath the outer hat section where everyone's on, you can see it's cracked and broken in there too. So we normally replace that. And I think that, um, and here's a look, I don't know if I have a comparison, but you can see we tried to beef up and had a bridge across this where that hole is. This is the hole where the landing gear rods go through, so we tried to bridge across that so this load is all concentrated right there because it just bends it and eventually breaks it. Now, if you have to replace that skin because the holes are all elongated, even this skin right here, well, how are you going to locate this pin where it's supposed to go? Well, we have a tool that we can send out that attaches to the hard points of the trunnion for the nose landing gear and also the actuator up in the nose area so you can locate where that pin is supposed to be. We send, we have a couple of them we send out to people from time to time. There's another picture of that pin sticking out. The whole idea of that structure is to locate and stabilize that pin. This is a 600. 
Now, people ask about the gross weight increase. What's really required? Well, we tie in the lower part of that half section to the forward pressure bulkhead. There's the forward pressure bulkhead, and this is attached with the plate across there. You can't see it very easily, but that keeps the lower part of that hat section from going left right, which is what cracks that vertical member too. Here's the vertical piece to be replaced if it's cracked on most of the way. And you can see here we have the skin off. And in order to get that skin off, a lot of times you have to strip the paint off so you can find the rivets. If you don't want to start drill rivets and find out here. You're making uh, figure eight holes in the guy's skin. So that's all been replaced. This was on the 101 triple one, I think. Here's some other things we've seen. He comes in for an annual and say, well, What the heck happened to the right engine? Oh, well, you know, I was down in South America and I, I hit a little uh, mound of dirt. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mm. Didn't want to go any further than that. <laughs> that story. You can see the, uh, the structure buckled here. And that's right, that's right behind the engine rail. Maybe I'll picture that. Here's what it looks like with the turtle back removed. And if you look right here, you see this is the nut that the bolt goes into from the whole the engine off, the lower, um, lower engine mount bolt. And when you have that, sometimes you'll see those rivets on the top of the wing uh, are loose also because it took a hell of a load and sometimes those, uh, those actually need to be replaced at that point. But you see, this, this goes into a captured nut and now the whole structure is starting to move. And I'm sure mechanics you know, that are familiar with the Aerostar see this stuff uh, most Owners well, wouldn't see it, but you can see there's uh, more than three washers right here in this fork bowl. And you kind of say, no, wait a minute, what, what's going on there? How come that's got more than four washers? Well, maybe it needed more than four if we got properly. Well, okay, well then now it's sitting down more, so you can see it's been scraping on it, but it goes through the rib. So we're going to have to take all that apart and rig it properly, and it all rigged out fine, but just Guys that don't work on it all the time don't see that stuff. Here's an extreme example of one airplane that came in, and uh, this is what your float vent valve should look like. And after they get done slotting the sealant in there and trying to fix the fuel leak, that one's all covered in sealant. I don't know if it worked or not, but of course, once you see that, it's got to come out and be replaced. So it makes a difference who you don't really want to take a look there and somebody fix. Here's a halon bracket. Now this airplane was really butchered. Uh, it was a gear up landing and uh, not in the log books. I think it was in Puerto Rico or someplace and they put it on a trailer and brought it back to the US and somebody put it all together with screws and that's what we started taking it apart and looking at things and that's what we Now the aileron and push pull tubes, sometimes you see they've been damaged and these go back behind your engine cell and an exhaust gas can be sucked back into that area and corrode the pipe as well. Um, here's one that's been dinged and uh, we've replaced quite a few of these just for corrosion. We have a little stack of them. Now this one airplane, I was, this is the same airplane I was moving the controls. I said, hey, we've got a squeak under the floor and there's something's wrong here. Okay, and they opened it up and they, um, it's real simple. That tube is supported on an eyebrow arm further aft. Well, they put it in the wrong hole on the eyebrow arm. It's too high. So they had to grind out. They just look like they used tin snips to, to cut out that, that hole in the, they call that an intercostal. And over here, it's scraping on the other side. And that's, uh, I think that might be the elevator, I'm not sure. And then, you know, when you do a raw change, you wash out the filter, and if you see a bunch of steel in there, 
pretty good indication of jam or lifters that go away. Yeah, they want to, you know, has, is it going to be a catastrophic failure? Probably not, but it's going to wear out the jam and lifters. And then this is a left hand wheel well with that cover that you've probably seen removed. And you can see that this is where the, uh, the heater, heater duct splits into two, winds into two, and then that goes through the wheel well and back through the back of your airplane. But sometimes you see that cover and it's all distorted. Well, that means you got an air leak there. That really hot heater air, the bleed air, is leaking out into that area. And that's why your heater doesn't work very well. And that's why pressurization could be an issue. So these things, experienced mechanics are going to look and see that and say, hey, take that off. You've got some ducts that are rotten in there. Just FYI, this is your fuel stump area. And this is the fuel coming in from the wing. <coughs> and this is your cross feed valve for the other engine, the right engine. That's from the other side. And this is a diagram we get up for somebody that just shows. What are you talking about when you say flapper valves? Well, this is a one-way flapper valve right here. And so that's to let fuel from that wing, uh, that's to let fuel from the fuselage tank go this way, but not reverse. And you have the same one inside here, but it's fuel from the wing going into this chamber, which is common so where the fuselage fuel can come in and the wind fuel can come in, but either one can go out or transfer to the other. Okay. That's the idea. Well, this is really that stuff, but if anybody has any questions, you can answer them later. Um, I think this is just one of the flight test guides we go through um, for winglets. They make up a, they make up a, uh, Form, I think that's it. But they make up a form for each condition, stalls, turning stalls, FCG, you know, you beat it to death. It's like certifying the airplane all over again whenever you make any aerodynamic changes. So you have to do a dive test. Um, we were doing one test with a, my son was in the back reading off these things. I got a test plan at the right seat. He says, you know, I can probably learn to fly this airplane as well as you can, but, you know, he was just a super good guy. He said, uh, why don't you just fly it? If there's anything I want to see, I'll just say my air. I said, okay. So I was doing all the flying. And my son's in the back. He says, okay, next test. Uh, we're at FCG, full power, uh, feet on the floor, hands off the controls, uh, climb at the blue line, full power, trim for that. And then um, cut one inch of the mixture control, count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and then recover. You ready? I said, no, we're not ready. <laughs> we're going to ease one throttle back and see what this thing's going to do. Well, after we did that, I said, OK, we're ready. Let's do it. And uh, it only went to a 45 degree bank in three seconds. With the feet on the floor, hands off the controls, cut one mixture at the blue line with 350 horsepower on one inch. So, what a great airplane. Um, when people say, well, it's dangerous, no, it's not at all. But if you're totally asleep, okay, it could be. But we do this, we do every single thing. One of the, one of the things, the only time you want to see it. Well, uh, we were doing the turning stalls. Accelerated stalls, which all that means is you're, you're slowing down at the rate of more than one knot per second, like three knots per second. And 30 degree bank, FCG, bullet controls back a little faster than normal, and then recover, and you have to be within 30 degrees of bank to the right and 60 to the left, and whatever. So I pulled it into the stall, and I was real experienced at the time doing that every other day. 
And I remember pulling that stick back and I said, well, we're in death and then it's shaking like hell. And I said, see, it's controllable. And he says, she's all done, let her go. <laughs> I said, okay, he's had enough of that. Of course, it's worse when you're not on the control. It's just watching it. Uh, but the last thing he did was he said, okay, I want to see this. My son reads it off. Okay, I want um, power off, gear down, flaps full, trim for um, 95 knots. And then uh, at some point, I want you to go full power and trim it out in full power, gear up, flaps up, do not trim. One extreme to the other, do not trim the airplane. And so I did that. And I said, okay, uh, once you get the flaps, I'll get the gear. I'll come in with full power and put the gear up. You get the flaps from zero, from 45 to zero. And I'm flying the airplane. He says, what's the force? What's the force? It has to be less than 60 pounds. I said, it's fingertip. He said, let me see that. My airplane. He says, oh, this is a grand airplane. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. That was a real experienced test pilot that flew Part 25 airplanes. Um, he was very impressed with the airplane. Okay. Yeah, we're done. I can listen to Jim on, speak all day long about the real star. We've eaten into our question and answer, so if you've got questions for Jim, catch him during the week in the, in the, at the different events and things of that nature. And uh, let's take a quick break. We've only got about two.